History podcast, a platform to examine pre modern Islamic, Islamic history, and a global medieval past. We are sponsored by IHRC Bookshop. Listeners get a 15% discount on purchases. Visit IHRC Bookshop at shop.ihrc.org and use discount code AHP15 at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Contact IHRC Bookshop for details. I'm your host, Talha Asan a PhD student at the School of Orange and African Studies in London. Now on to the show. Today will be an unusual episode, as we will explain. Abu Muhammad al-Hariri was an Arab poet, scholar and Seljuk government official who died in 1122 Common Era, aged 68 years old. His work, Al-Maqamat, a a compilation of 50 highly stylized comic anecdotes about the exploits of trickster Abu Zaid received widespread renown in his time across the Muslim world and is regarded as a high point of Arabic literature. We are pleased to be joined by Nassim Hassani in Tehran. Ms. Hassani holds a master's degree in Islamic studies from Shahid Beheshti University, Tehran where her dissertation was an analysis of Mary and Jesus' birth and early life in Quran and Apocrypha, James and Infancy Gospel of Thomas. She has a number of articles and translations and publications. Find her link to her LinkedIn profile in the description below. This is an unusual episode in that despite attempts at Zoom calls, the internet is currently too unstable in Iran, so instead I have sent audio files of my questions which she has kindly edited together for our presentation. Welcome, Ms. Hassani. Al-Hariri was born in Basra, 1054 Common Era. He was descended from a companion of the Prophet Muhammad. His family was wealthy. Before we look at, at his work, what do we know about the author's life and social political context? Uh, hello everyone. First of all, I want to express my gratitude for having me here today and I apologize for delay in sending um, my presentation and um, uh, my voices. Uh, as uh, Talha mentioned, uh, due to our situation in Iran and the internet service breakdown, I wasn't able to send it. But um, now I'm here. And as a fan of uh, Arab literature and Islamic art, I'm pretty excited about this podcast. Um, today, um, discussing al Hariri's Ma'amad is a great honor considering uh, that they are regarded as one of the greatest treasures of Arabic literature. And uh, I will try to make the most of this episode by discussing every facet of Hariri's life and work. And uh, I aim to impress upon our listeners what a phenomenal work al Hari has done by creating his Maghamad. However, uh, first, uh, we will look into al Hari's early years and early life to discover uh, how he came to be known and why his writing is still among the most influential in Arabic literature. Uh, as we already know, al Hari is most well known for his Maqamad, which is sometimes cited as the second greatest masterpiece of Arabic literature after the Holy Quran. Uh, looking back on al Hayri's early years, we can see that he had a deep-seated love of both literature uh, and um, uh, poetry. He was born in a city close to Basra in 1054 uh, AD, and he grew up there and spent most of his maturity in his hometown, where he also passed away in 1122 AD. Because of this, he is frequently referred to as Al-Hayri of Basra. Since uh, his 
ancestors may be traced back to one of Muhammad's uh, companions, Hadri uh, was incredibly proud of his Arab background. Looking at his educational background, we can see that it is quite strong and remarkable. Hayri has always loved uh, Arabic literature and uh, because uh, he was born into a wealthy family, uh, he was able to get a solid education and pursue a career in um, jurisprudence. Initially, he worked as a munchi. Munchi means <clears throat> secretary, also known as a writer. Although uh, most of his life was spent in Basra, uh, he also often traveled to Baghdad. It is said that he used to conduct his literary pursuit in Baghdad and had economic interest in Basra. Uh, Her afterward resided in the Bani Haram neighborhood and finished his studies in theology and hadith. Uh, but literature and vocabulary were his main interest and he quickly rose to the top of his field as a scholar. If we look at his career, we can see that Hayri uh, started as a literary author, but he was also an Arab poet and linguist. Uh, interestingly, his most notable piece, al Makamat, encompasses all aspects of his education, uh, from literature to Arab heritage. In addition uh, to his Makamat, Hayri also authored two books, Mulhatul Arab, and Durrat al Qawas fi Aham al Akhwas, which are both distinct feats that focus on grammar and errors among literary scholars. When we have a peek into his private life, there is not much um, that we know of just that he was married, uh, had two sons, and both of them were trained to recite the father's famous makamat. That's the only information we have on Hayri's past. To there are certainly many more details that are not known. And yet it is enough to acknowledge that Hayri had a devotion to literature and committed his life to create one of the greatest masterpieces in Arabic literature. Um, if I want to respond um, to the second part of your question about uh, his social and uh, political um, aspects of his life, I have to say, al hayri focused on two primary themes in the Maqamad al hayri Kodaya, I mean begging, uh, which refers to begging, and Waz, which is a preaching. He employed both themes to address various uh, prevalent issues in his time, including those of political, social, religious, and economic nature. Despite the weak political systems of the 10th century Islamic world, new literary genres emerged, including the Magama genre, which Al Hayri employed. His Magamat featured historical events of his era, such as the Christian Crusades against the Muslims. Additionally, uh, he tackled two major social issues of his time I mean, uh, drinking wine and homosexuality. In addition, Al Hayri preached to various groups, which included rulers, ordinary citizens, and himself, as well as those concerned with deaths and seniors. The last Maghamad written by Al Hayri reflect the psychological aspects of his poetry, which may have been a response to um, a criticism he faced in Baghdad that challenged his uh, eloquence and linguistic abilities. Um, Al Hayri tackled the, uh, the societal issues of his time uh, pragmatically, um, uh, recognizing that realistic literature is um, intertwined with religious, economic, and political uh, factors. He preferred to discuss events and uh, facts in his society through the Kodaya form, as it was a more suitable means of expression. Through his engagement with uh, contemporary literature, Al Hari communicated his vision and demonstrated how connected he was to the societal concerns of his time. His thoughts were uh, conveyed uh, through the Magama genre, which comprised both poetry and prose. Kodeya is not um, just uh, evident in the words of ordinary people, but it's also apparent in the works of writers and poets. Studying uh, the psychological, religious, and social factors 
a present in Magomad al Hayri's poetry within its historical context naturally leads us to a discussion of the various forms of the um, of the uh, social and political life of the time. This analysis enables us to understand uh, al Hayri's uh, decision to include uh, certain factors in his poetry and prose. The Maghamad al Hayri um, possesses uh, not only stylistic beauty and educational qualities, but also provides valuable insights into the social life of the Arab world during the Middle Age. Middle Ages. Uh, I mean, definitely, it is clear that the, that the ruling class was weak and incapable of controlling the public, uh, leading to confusion, a lack of safety, and instability among the masses. Most people lived in extreme poverty, and misrule resulted in an uh, unequal distribution of wealth between the upper and lower classes. It is challenging to find evidence of a middle class during this period. It's the most important uh, point of this uh, analysis. Uh, al Imad al Hanbali, in his book, um, uh, which is Shazarat uh, al Zahab, noted that when Fakhru Dawla, uh, a buid ruler, died, he left behind a considerable amount of money, silver, and jewels, while his people reminded. Uh, impoverished. Fakhrudullah cannot be solely blamed for the the circumstances of his time. Many leaders during that period were also guilty of excessive spending why the people suffered and uh, resorted to eating dead animals and crops due to the high cost of goods. Ibn Kasir, in his book, uh, al Kamel uh, Fetarikh, uh, I mean the complete history, describes how uh, malnutrition uh, caused many to fa- uh, fall ill and die during this painful era, which was also characterized uh, by the presence of numerous beggars uh, known as Ahl al or Mukaddin. According to Abdul Hadi Harb, uh, because were present in public even before the Islamic period, however, during the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, it was often scholars, others, and thinkers who asked for money or food in exchange for knowledge. The speakers posed a threat as they disregarded customs, laws, traditions, and religious. Al-Tabari reports and mentions that beggars in Baghdad were responsible uh, for hurting, robbing, and sometimes even uh, kidnapping women and children, those who uh, refused to give their their money were often killed. Abdul Hadi Hab suggests that the emergence of beggars during this era was not solely due to the uh, corruption of the political and social systems. He argues that Arab resided with non-Arabs in various um, regions, such as Persia, Turkey, and Iraq, which resulted in the mixing of blood and ideas. The Arab culture typically fraud upon begging for money in, or food, as it was reviewed as a loss of dignity. Loss of dignity. However, uh, they may have learned this practice from the non-Arab residents they lived amongst. Uh, finally, Maghamad in general and the Maghamad al hari in particular uh, were presentations of the political and social life during that time, and they constitute important documentary evidence of how people lived and taught during that era. Before we speak about his Al-Maqamat and this specific illustrated edition, tell us more about the genre of Arabic literature. Uh, When we talk about uh, Arabic literature, we get two things, poetry and prose. This is all Arab literature is composed of. However, in recent years, poetry has taken a bigger place in Arabic literature and uh, prose can be found hardly. 
the main focus is on traditional uh, poetry. Thus, um, uh, prose is being neglected big time and is in, in significant in number. But I like to think that the reason Maromot is so valuable for Arab literature is because there aren't many of them. Um, since we are here um, uh, talking about al Hayri's Maramad, we all dive into that one directly. Maramad is not different type of literature, but a collection of short reigned proofs. If we can closely uh, we look closely at the word Maramad, um, uh, we could learn that it is the plural of uh, a Maramad, uh, which means assembly. So it explains the name that a Maram is an assembly or complica- uh, a compilation of uh, short prose. That what's what's more in that uh, is that it always follows a pattern. They were invented first in the 11th century and lasted to the 19th century, but um, the pattern didn't change. You know, um, each uh, marama contains all maramats, uh, contains almost. 50 short pieces of prose and contains mainly two characters, a protagonist and a narrator, both related to each other. Maramats are an absolute uh, masterpiece in Arab or any literature. I will use Arena de Rewards here to explain the beauty uh, of Maramat. According to her, uh, each Maramat uh, contains two tempests. Um, and uh, contains practically everything from literary models to particular themes, motives, situations, verses um, of Quran and poetry, figures of speech, cliches, and read- ready made rhymed prose formulas. In simpler words, Maramats are the treasure of Arab literature and contain all the best literature has to offer. Now let's go a little back and see how it all started. Badu uh, Zaman al Hamadani. He's known to be the earliest pr- uh, practitioner of the Maghamad and, uh, and also called the man of uh, letters. His best known work uh, was called the Maghamad Badu Zaman al Hamadani, which was a collection of uh, 40, uh, uh, sorry, 52 prose. At least known um, a practitioner of the Maramat is uh, Muhammad al Mawlihi. However, not a lot of scholars uh, and writers have done um, justice to Prus and Maramat. Almost all the attention was diverted uh, to poetry, and no one could bring the magic out of prose. Well, uh, no one well, until uh, Muhammad al Ghassim al Hariri. Um, gave prose writing and maramat a new meaning and made it a voice uh, of other Arabic literature. His most famous maramat consisted of a um, 50 short um, uh, Turkish taste and are what made him the true successor of uh, Hamadani. Both of these writers, through their masterpieces, have given prose the place uh, it deserved in literature. Uh, you know, their work has made rained prose and maramat synonyms to each other. Badia Zaman al Hamdani's writings were unparalleled, and though many other writers after him uh, tried to e- uh, imitate uh, his style, none could match him. What makes him and his work so special is, is the fact that his imagination and the way he described the events of his time uh, and, um, and this make the reader uh, makes the reader feel like they are uh, witnessing it with their own eyes that's the best quality any writer uh, could possess and Hamadani was surely blessed with this talent uh, you don't just need words to discuss something you require the best use of your imagination and your feelings to aspire through your words since not many posted this skill, he saw a major. Uh, we saw a major uh, decline in Maghamat writing after Hamadani. No one could match his level until Hariri. Interestingly, Al Hariri didn't just match his level, but was able to gather more readers. Whenever we talk about Arabic literature, 
uh, the contributions of these two writers and their revival of Maghamad writing by Harik cannot be missed. Before we dive into this Pacific Illustrated edition, give us an overview of Al Hariri's Al Maqamat. Uh, well, yes, uh, Hariri's Maghamad are famous for a reason. He knows how to bring the greatest elements of literature together and paste them into words. As we have already briefly um, discussed the origins of Maghamad and what they mean, let's take a closer look at it uh, from Hairi's perspective. We know that Hamadani introduced us to the concept of Maghamad by compiling 52 short proses in his unique style. But it was al Hairiz al Maghamad that gave Arabic literature a new meaning and purpose. Maghamad al Hairi consists of um, 50 proses uh, and it's a Turkish tale between a narrator named al Haris ibn al Hammam and his uh, wedding encounters with Abu Zaid al Suruji. Abu Zaid was a wanderer with uh, all the eloquence, grammatical powers, and a poetic skill, uh, a skill of Hayri. He liked to visit different locations and speak to different individuals, uh, telling them about his fiction struggles and making them sound uh, sorrowful by adding a dash of misery and poetry, which caused people's hearts to break. And soon after he used uh, to attract people's attention, along with their uh, sympathies and presence. He would just vanish. In this case, you will find humor, poetry, the peak of Arab literature, among with the unique abilities of Hayri. I want to, before jump into the specific Maghamad, please, uh, let's talk about uh, wh- what those tales are about and what proposed they said. There is no doubt that Hayri has put immense talent in his writings and all of his work is a depiction of grammatical knowledge with hints of poetry and humor. Um, His experience as an informative officer has played a huge role in his writing as well. Almost all all of his uh, maghamot carry a unique attribute in them. For example, you will notice that one of his maghama is read the same whether you read it from the beginning to the end or from the end uh, to the beginning. It isn't that fascinating. <laughs> Interesting. That's something that you don't come across often. And uh, to witness a piece of writing like that in the prehistoric world is quite intriguing. Similarly, uh, there is another prose in which there are only non-dotted Arabic letters. That's another uh, rarity um, th- that you will only see in al Hayri's uh, Maghamat. I mean, if you would just uh, read those tales, you won't just get lost in the story and the characters, but the uniqueness will capture your mind as well. Another thing that I would like to mention here, uh, since we are talking about al Hayri's Maghamat, is how natural and authentic uh, their themes are. Um, sure, there is humor in those tales, but at some point you will find pain, agony, and injustice too. Harry was never shy to openly discuss the problems surrounding their world and put them into his Maghamat. We will further discuss some of the some of them later. But in all his maghamat, you will see that uh, he has given a great personality to his heroes and have spoken about the elders and the uh, uh, rangers of the society. One thing that I found pretty interesting in this uh, maghamat is that his heroes never settle in a particular city. You'll notice uh, they are always wandering from one place to another and looking for means to earn money. What's more thrilling is that those methods are never uh, conventional. It's not like that the main character is a trader or a politician and killing himself to earn uh, some um, pennies. No, 
and the mindset behind not doing normal labor is to not have any uh, authoritative force over their heads. You can say that they are uh, their own boss and that's what makes them a hero. Uh, other than that one of that most common issue uh, that al Hari uh, has witnessed in his society and included in his writing is hypocrisy among the government officials and religious figures. And there is no denying that it is a reality of today's world too. Uh, this hypocrisy can be seen in a number of his maghamat through the art of storytelling that even um, the modern world will relate to. Uh, because the issues uh, that the, he pointed out and wrote about them uh, centuries ago are still a part of this world. So um, this clearly explains how authentic and everlasting Harry work is. And now turning to this splendid illustrated edition, tell us what's so special about it. This version, I mean Wasati's version, is one of the finest works of Hariri and is illustrated by Yahya ibn Mahmud al Wasiti. Uh, Wasiti's version of this Magoma is being kept in the National Library in Paris, yeah, as you know, and is known to be one of the most uh, first class painting works. Al Wasiti used the best of his imagination and thoughts out of the box while illustrating these artworks. The representation of characters, backgrounds, scenarios, and the keen attention to detail is worth noting. Um, you can say that through these illustrations, the words have come to life. Just by looking at this artwork, you can effortlessly understand what the story is and what the writer is trying to convey. More than that, through these illustrations, uh, uh, one can easily grasp the culture and norms of that era and um, can have a peek at the medieval life of Iraq. Now let's come to this uh, first illustration you can see on your screen, it's uh, the Chef Mahoma uh, and it uh, features Harry's main protagonist, Abu Zaid al Saruji. Uh, we won't be discussing uh, the whole story since it would take a while, uh, but I'm explaining uh, some key points of these stories. Uh, for example, in this uh, Chef Mahoma, you will see that Abu Zaid is dressed as a religious preacher wandering and trapping a caravan. In this caravan, you will see that the other main uh, character, I mean, Harris ibn al-Hammam, is also present. Abu Zaid is preaching the members in the caravan with religious sermons and telling them how they should work uh, for the hereafter and uh, not waste their time in a worldly life. After this is, after this is showered with money, with money and uh, presents uh, uh, from the members for his impressive sermons and he flees off. However, Haris ibn al-Hamma gets curious and starts following him and later finds Abu Zaid in a drunken estate with bottles of wine in his home. As we see, Wasiti has depicted each and everything in these illustrations from representing Abu Zaid drinking and listening to singers. Why? On the other hand, you can also see Haris ibn al-Hammam confronting him for his opposing behavior from the religious preacher one. Next, we have an illustration, which you will also find in the French National Library and is another illustration for the 12th Maghama. In this illustration, Wasiti has represented a 13th century pop-up of the Islamic world and has included various elements that aren't originally present in the story. This is done so that the readers can have a better understanding and visualization of the story. Now look at this another bit of example also uh, painted by al Wasiti. This one illustration is holding three different scenarios. The main story features, again, uh, both the main characters together, Abu Zaid al-Saruji and Harsad and Hammam. They can be seen riding a camel and traveling through a village uh, where they encounter a young man. This story is about the social ethics in which Hayri is telling the social ethics of his community. The story is quite uh, vast, so I uh, just uh, quickly explain the main idea and what's going on in the illustration. Uh, the story goes uh, like that Abu Zaid uh, tells the younger boy uh, that he will give them a sermon in exchange 
uh, for some dates or money. But the boy straight up declines and tells them that not any poem can be bought in exchange for barely gain. As you can see in the picture, the illustration below shows two men riding a camel and a young man in front of them. The attention to detail in each character's expression is something worth noting. You can see the astonishment and misery in Abu Zaid's eyes and the dishonesty in the boy's eyes. When we look at the middle portion of this illustration, we witness a pond uh, with beautiful flora and fauna around. This is the prices depiction uh, of Rara Raif um, since the tale is taking place in a village. Wasiti has missed nothing while portraying this Maroma and has done proper justice to every detail and every character, from the background to the architecture of that time. Everything is on point and gives the reader an insight into the writer's mind. And finally, uh, before we end, tell us where listeners can turn next to learn more about today's topic. And what are other current projects that listeners can anticipate from yourself? Uh, Harris Maromar uh, is now less than a treasure for Arab literature uh, and is uh, treated as uh, such in the present times too. Uh, many versions are available in several libraries for readers to uh, revel in. Some of the famous available versions of Al Hayri Al Maromat can be found in the National Library in Cairo um, and uh, in the East Studies Center of St. Petersburg. Both these versions are said to be the most basic version of the Maromat book. Uh, as uh, for the more detailed version with more illustrations and almost um, uh, 50, um, 50 events, you can look at the National Library in Paris and National Library in Vienna. And um, for more um, um, discoveries and research, you can uh, find um, some uh, Maroma in other language, I mean in Hebrew, and I'm working on uh, one of it, it uh, named, uh, it names um, uh, Tahkemoni. Uh, this is a Hebrew Maroma. Um, a scholar said that uh, this Maroma um, is parallel with uh, Maromat al Hayri and is a fascinating uh, work. As to answer the second part of your question, uh, yes, um, I have a few projects that I'm currently working on. Um, for example, one of my publications, uh, The Virgin Mary's Birth and Early Life in the Two Narratives, is under print and will be available for readers pretty soon, and it will be uh, published by Rutledge in a volume. And uh, my, uh, my work on uh, interpretation, uh, interpretation of the Gospels by Abdullah Galadiri um, is uh, already published, but in Persian. And uh, the other uh, one is a translation uh, from a book uh, by Manfred Oming. Uh, um, it's called uh, Contemporary Biblical Hermeneutics and Introduction. Um, by Manfred Oming, and um, it would be published uh, pretty soon in Iran. Uh, it, it's a Persian translation. And uh, I have another article, I mean, um, another translation uh, from uh, Swimming Against the Current, a Muslim Conversion to Christianity in the early, in the early Islamic period uh, by Christian Sonner. Um, um, and... Uh, this is published in Persian. And uh, I have another uh, publication, um, The Camel Passing Through the Eye of the Needle, a Quranic um, interpretation. And um, about myself, I have to say that I'm a multilingual and have a devotion to writing. I mostly work on translation, uh, usually uh, for prehistoric Arab culture or Islamic writings. And um, I'm seeking for a PhD position about apocrypha uh, and early Christianity uh, manuscripts. And uh, as a hobby, and maybe um, um, seriously, I work on Islamic art 
uh, especially on uh, Quran manuscripts. Uh, and this is all that I have to say about myself. And uh, at the end, thank you very much for having me on this podcast today. Um, I had a fun time talking about one of my greatest interests, uh, Arabic manuscripts and uh, Islamic miniature. And uh, I hope I gave our audience enough insight into the most outstanding uh, work of Arabic literature there is. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for being a guest on the Absid History Podcast.